Good afternoon. It's uh, good to be able to welcome you to the afternoon session of our conference. Uh, thank you very much for coming and we look to God for his help as we once again look at the scriptures. Thank our brother John for coming along. We're going to start our afternoon session with 134. 134. Uh, John brought our minds very much onto the person of the Lord Jesus. And 134 says, Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast, the sweeter far thy face to see, and in thy presence rest. Jesus, our only joy be thou, as thou our prize will be. Jesus, be thou our glory now, and through eternity. 134, we stand if we're able to sing. <coughs> Jesus, the very thought of thee, with sweetness fills my breast, but sweet afar thy face to see, and in thy this morning uh, with the Lord Jesus uh, as our focus and our Father we give thanks uh, for that for uh, the more we view him the more we're filled with wonder uh, at uh, just uh, how glorious he is just how perfect he is and we're so thankful that he is so different to us for our God as we view the, perfect, <coughs> the perfection of who he is of how he could say that the prince of this world comes and finds nothing in me. We give thanks that we could uh, just meditate upon the fact that uh, your soul is delighted in him, uh, that you could open the heavens and declare, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And our God, we're so thankful that we have a saviour who is so utterly different to us, that our God, as we view our own frailties and failings, as we view the sin in our life, we give thanks that we come in the name 
and we rest upon uh, the one who is utterly perfect, uh, the one uh, who is utterly dependable, uh, the one who has satisfied you absolutely and completely. We give our thanks, our God, uh, that in your wonderful grace you have made us alive and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our God, we give thanks that in him uh, we can be no closer uh, to you. In him we can be no more uh, perfect uh, than what we are. Our God, we give thanks for all that we have in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, our God, we pray that you'd help John as he once again opens the scriptures and speaks of Christ. We pray that our hearts would be open uh, to listen, that our hearts would respond in worship and adoration, and that there would be a response in the way in which we live our lives, that having known something more of Christ, that we might live in a way something closer to him. And so, our God, we commit our time to you, giving our thanks in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. <coughs> Thanks very much again, John, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say this afternoon. At this time, please, we'll turn to Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52, and we'll read verses 13 <coughs> to 15. But before we do so, just to recap... I say recap, the uh, teachers in the midst may call it reinforcement. <coughs> we want to reinforce, not repeat, reinforce what we've said already. We said in relation to Isaiah 42 this morning <coughs> that this is the one of the so-called servant songs of Isaiah, and we mentioned the four found in Isaiah 42 verses 1 to 9, and secondly in Isaiah 49 verses 1 to 13. The third of those four is found in chapter 50, Isaiah 50, verses 4 to 11, and this last one, chapter 52 verse 13 through to the end of chapter 53, that's chapter 53 and verse 12. <coughs> and we said again that the Four of those servant songs are bookended, that is, they begin and they end with this statement that we will read in Isaiah 52, verse 13, Behold my servant. And we said that the prophet here, as well as in chapter 42, wants to draw our attention to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jehovah's servant. He has marked him out, and because he's marked him out as wholly distinct and worthy of our attention, he bids us to fix our gaze upon him. And I hope we found it a joy this morning to examine and to scrutinise aspects of the servant of Jehovah. And that's what we want to do again this afternoon. We said from... <coughs> <coughs> we said from chapter 2, 42, verses 1 to 3, we saw the servant Godward. God's verdict, God's judgment and assessment of his son. Mine elect, he says, in whom my soul delighteth. We saw the servant Selfward, one who shall not cry, says Isaiah, nor lift up his voice. And we saw the servant Manwood, again, chapter 42, and we spoke of a bruised reed, shall he not break, and the smoking flax, shall he not quench. So let's read chapter 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, he shall be exalted and extolled, and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, and that which had not been told them shall they see, 
and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Now just perhaps because we only really spoke in Isaiah 42 this morning, I thought it might be good just to pencil in, shall we say, a little bit more detail on the others of the servant songs. So just turn for a moment to Isaiah 49. Because we said this morning that Isaiah 42, the focus of Isaiah 42 was upon the character, the character of the servant. And we shall look in a moment or two at the conduct of the servant in Isaiah 52, verses 13 to 15, which is what we've read. To put it another way, Isaiah 42, as we've said, speaks of the character, something about the person of the servant. So come to Isaiah 49, verse 1. Listen, O Isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. I hope. But if you don't, we'll turn back to Isaiah 42 and just read what we commented upon. Because there in Isaiah 42, we spoke about it, the fact that he will take judgment and judgment to the Gentiles. That's the end of chapter 42, verse 1. And so we're beginning, we're introduced to, and it's expanded in Isaiah 49, something of the scope of the servant's ministry. So we said we look at him in his character, and then we see the development of the prophet as he now moves from that consideration of his character to something of his actions, his deeds, and in this instance the scope, the breadth of that ministry. It stretches beyond just the nation of Israel. It stretches out from the nation of Israel, out to the Gentiles. Chapter 42, verse, the end of verse 1, spoke of him bringing forth judgment to the Gentiles. And so in Isaiah 49, verse 1, says the prophet, Listen, O isles, unto me. Beyond the initial scope of his ministry. Down to verse number 6 in Isaiah 49. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends, or sorry, unto the end of the earth. You see the scope then. Again, we can link it back to chapter 42 and verse 3. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Who else could fulfill this ministry, the breadth of this ministry, the scope of this ministry, covering the whole of the earth than the Lord Jesus Christ himself? But just in case you're in any doubt, and it helps after a lovely lunch to keep you all awake, and say, turn over to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. I'll give you the background while you're turning to it. In Luke chapter 2, the Lord as a babe is in the arms of Simeon. He's been taken to the temple and that babe is lifted up in the arms of Simeon. And this is what Simeon says, Luke chapter 2, verse 32. A light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. A direct reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. A direct reference quoted by Simeon. And where did he quote it from? Well, you know the answer because we've just read it in Isaiah 49. So the New Testament demonstrates that the one of whom Isaiah wrote is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ who was taken up in the arms of Simeon as a babe and declared to be the fulfilment 
of that which Isaiah had written of 700 years before the event. Come over to chapter 50. In chapter 50, perhaps most conclusively in respect to the servant songs, let's read verse 4. The Lord hath given me the, the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He waketh morning by morning, he waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. And again coming down to verse 7. For the Lord will give help, will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. That little section, that little description is the Lord in his earthly ministry. Come back for a moment to the verse that precedes it. Verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Now, I hope I don't need to link those particular references to passages in the New Testament, as I'm sure you know we could. And I hope that it leave you in no doubt that they describe not just the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the culmination of that earthly ministry, particularly in the events leading up to, the Cal to Calvary, to the cross, his crucifixion. And you read them, and you read them, thinking of the events that happened. His crucifixion, he gave his back to the smiters. He was scourged. The Roman lash ploughed deep its furrows upon his back. So you can see, not just in Isaiah 49, the scope of the servant's ministry. That's continued into chapter 50, and the detail. The precise detail recorded 700 years before the event by the prophet Isaiah. As we come to chapter 52, and others that we could read in chapter 3, or the verses that we could read in chapter 53, the focus has shifted again. Chapter 42, we've mentioned we deal with the character <coughs> of the servant. Chapter 49 and 50, we deal with something of the ministry, the service of the servant, and the scope, the extent of that service. But as we come from chapter 50 into chapter 52 and 53, the focus of the servant, the focus of the view of the servant that we're given, <coughs> is of his sufferings. His sufferings. And you'll notice we read it in verse 14. Many were astonished at thee. <clears throat> his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. <coughs> so that, as it were, gives you a little background of the link between the servant songs of Isaiah, the development of the truth in those servant songs, and what we'll be exploring a little more of this afternoon. Let me return to what we said. First of all in Isaiah 42.1, but it's repeated here again in Isaiah 52.13. Behold, my servant. And as the writer in Isaiah 42 wants us to focus and fix our gaze upon the Saviour and see him in his beauties, in his glories, in his perfections, and wants us to meditate upon that. So now as he comes to consider something of the servant's sufferings, he wants us to do exactly the same. Let me just say that again, he wants us to do exactly the same. While it might not be the sole focus of our meditations on Sunday morning as we gather for what some may call communion, what we might call the breaking of bread, 
It is the remembrance gathering, the remembrance feast, and we think upon often, and we contemplate often, the sufferings of the servant. Now, I gave you five this morning, so I'm going to pencil in another couple and leave you to find the final three. Who are the servants? Behold my servant. Who are those servants? Because there are ten, we said. Well, we gave you five. If you didn't get the notes, you can ask me and I'll tell you the five again. But this afternoon, remember this one. God's question, and God's question to Satan. Are you with me there? He asked the question, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's another one. A remarkable man. Remarkable, but remarkable in highlighting the sovereignty of God. And Job is an example of that. Another example of the sovereignty of God is found in the prophecy of Jeremiah. This one is an unusual one. I, Jeremiah 25, 9. God points to a Gentile king and describes him. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. But you see, we've given you five, we've given you another two. Whether you consider any of that initial five and the greatness of that initial five, or you could think of the other two, both of whom you'd have to describe, certainly Nebuchadnezzar, as being not Jews but Gentiles. And they are singled out, they are pointed to as servants, that is, those who obeyed the command, Nebuchadnezzar, you might not have thought of. And I'd have to say, I'd understand that but one whom God used for the accomplishment of his purposes. We marvel sometimes at the sovereignty of God, who he takes up, who he uses. We wouldn't have necessarily thought of them, used them in the way that God does, but his purposes are worked out nevertheless by them. But we make the same point as we survey them all. Varying degrees of relationship, varying degrees of faithfulness, varying degrees of success in service and testimony. But what we know of them all is that they were failures. And so scripture, and that's one of the remarkable things of scripture, isn't it? It doesn't gloss over the mistakes. It doesn't gloss over the failures. But in exposing the failures of every human being, it enables us to see in stark contrast, in glorious contrast, the fact of the perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. What makes him wholly distinct is that he is Jehovah's perfect servant. Well, says the prophet, I will justify that statement. Notice again, verse 13, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. That bears out what we've just said. Some of you may be, well, probably old, all of you are old enough to remember um, one who became, he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, he became Prime Minister, and his favourite word was prudence. Hmm. Um, until he'd left office and the years had passed and the examination of the government and the nation's accounts were made and um, prudence was exposed to be just a little bit <coughs> not quite accurate. We'll not say any more upon that lest you think I'm politically biased. But you get the point, don't you? This servant deals prudently, wisely. And he does so without fear of challenge or contradiction. You see, we can prove that because 
Unlike Gordon Brown, I'll name him, unlike Gordon Brown, when you examine the outcomes of his actions, what do you see? And that's the problem, isn't it? At the time, perhaps he was lauded, I don't know, I don't follow, follow politics that closely, but perhaps at the time he was lauded as, uh, you know, so different a chancellor, one who kept his eye on the public finances, one who was scrupulous in keeping the national accounts. But then, as the scrutiny is made, and this is what we're talking about here, isn't it? Behold my servant. You can scrutinise, you can examine, you can put under the microscope. But says the prophet, my servant shall deal prudently. Look at the outcomes. How are the outcomes productive? Do they demonstrate that wisdom that the prophet claims that he has? Well, this servant, unlike all others, brings, brings insight and understanding to all that he does. I'll give you a few examples. There are numerous of them. Numerous occasions when the Pharisees and the scribes came together and they sought to find occasion against the Lord, some way in which they could trip him up, either in his words or in his deeds. And with great guile and subtlety, they formed questions. And they did so with one purpose, to try and catch him out. They applied all of their education and their intellect, all that training that they had received, and they thought, what does this uneducated Galilean have to offer against the combined intellect and force of we Pharisees and scribes? Hmm? Matthew chapter 22. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. That's verse 15. You see, they came together. They took counsel. It wasn't just one of them. It wasn't just a small group or cabal of them. It was all of them. Combined. And they brought in the scribes. We shall see that in a moment. And they went out unto him, sent out unto him their disciples, notice this, with the Herodians. You see how they're combining all their forces. A majority, a big majority against one. And they asked the question, Master, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar? or not. The combined intellect thought, ah, we've captured him here. Because if he answers this way, we've got him. If he answers that way, we've got him. It doesn't really matter how he answers, we think we've presented him with the unanswerable question. We'll trap him. And the Lord's reply, remarkable, isn't it? He says, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's and their combined intellect the combined intellect of the religious leaders the political leaders the societal leaders all of them combined fell away in confusion at the profundity of the statement of the Lord Jesus. Let me give you another. A man with a withered hand. Luke chapter 6 records it. And Luke tells us the background. He says the scribes and the Pharisees, notice again, their combined forces, they watched him. You can imagine it, can't you? Watching him very much but in a different context and in a completely different way. When the servant says, Behold my servant, yes, they were watching him. Their eyes were fixed upon him. Whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might have an accusation against him. 
but the Lord knew their thoughts. And we note their combined forces and how they allied themselves together that they might bring the Lord Jesus Christ down. But remarkably, he used the law, the law upon which they relied, the law in which they were supposed to be the experts, and he used that against them to defeat them. And he healed the man. But he healed him with a word, not by contact. And in healing him by a word, defeated them defeated them in his actions. Brought blessing to the individual, but brought defeat to his attackers. Surely then we can see, and we could pile example upon example, that this servant deals prudently. How do we know? Because we've seen the profundity of his answer. We've seen the care and concern and compassion of his action. We've seen blessing brought to the man with the withered hand, as well as confusion brought to those that would seek to trip him up. Here's the remarkable wisdom. Defeating the combined minds and intellects of the religious leaders of the day, here is one in whom the Apostle Paul could say, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. They and again we come back to man's estimations, don't we? They viewed him as an uneducated Galilean. And yet the combined intellects of the scribes, the Pharisees, the Herodians were no match for the Saviour. But then there's another angle on that particular statement. My servant shall deal prudently. There's another aspect in terms of the assessment of those outcomes. What do I mean? Well, I'm sure if you talk to um, Labour voters, I'm not sure, but I would suspect that quite a few of them would um, think, still think that Gordon Brown was a good guy. After all, he was a Labour Chancellor, wasn't he? And we've not had Labour governments for some time, so Gordon Brown, well, by definition, must have been a good guy. What am I getting at? Well, I'm getting at the possibility, you see, that in assessment of the success of the outcomes of an individual, uh, a little bit of bias might be introduced, depending on where we come from, what our view might be. Is it merely a matter of opinion? <coughs> So the Conservatives might say, well, Gordon Brown was a disaster. And the Labour Party say, well, Gordon Brown was a good guy. So who's right? Well, it's not a matter of opinion amongst men or women or anyone else. It's not whether people agree or even whether the majority agree. Because Matthew records and the other Gospel writers record and I'm taking you to the Mount of Transfiguration, and it was mentioned. Taking you to the Mount of Transfiguration, because what's important is not man's verdict, it's God's verdict, it's heaven's verdict. And in Matthew 17 and verse 5, <coughs> the heavens are opened, and a declaration is made from those opened heavens. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And so, not just here in Isaiah's prophecy, but in the actual life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the heavens were opened. Heaven's estimate was given. Heaven's declaration and assessment was made known. This, the Lord Jesus Christ, this one, God's perfect servant, was the one in whom he was well pleased, the one in whom he found all his delight. This servant deals prudently. Again, we might think of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in that prayer to his Father in John 17. 
And he said in verse 4, I have glorified thee, the Father, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now it's not a matter of human opinion. It's not a matter of intellectual <coughs> or political debate. The servants' actions and their outcomes can bear the scrutiny of heaven. And there's no greater, more careful scrutiny than that. And if you were to progress through the last of the servant songs of Isaiah, yes, you would find man's estimation, and we mentioned it this morning. Man's estimation, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And you contrast it, you contrast it with heaven's estimate. My servant shall deal prudently. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But then let's move to the next little phrase in verse 13. If we needed ratification of God's view, if we needed confirmation, here it is. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. If we're in any doubt as to whom that, of whom that speaks, you could go back to Isaiah chapter 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6 we have a very similar phrase to the one that's used here. And in ver chapter 6 and verse 1, the prophet writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now, I was talking about, and someone confirmed, it's always nice when I find somebody who's at least on a similar wavelength. And I have such strange wavelengths, I'm surprised I find anyone on the same wavelength as me, but uh, thank you, Richard. You have a new Bible as well, I think. Good, good, good. And Rick, um, Michael has one as well, so. That's three of us that must be wrong. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, the point I'm getting at here in Isaiah 6 verse 1 is this. Because what Mr. Newbury in his Bible does is he puts a little bit of help in the margins for people like me. And he points out, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. And he puts in the margin who that Lord is. Is it the Father or is it the Son? And he uses the divine title, a little bit of technical, I'll throw that in for you. And the Hebrew is Adonai, a clear reference to God, a clear reference to deity. So we come across, notice it says, in Isaiah 6, sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. That's Isaiah's vision of God. Go down the chapter and you'll get confirmation of that, whether you want to take the Hebrew or not. And you come across into chapter 52, verse 13. And it says of the servant, it says of the son, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. I hope you get the point I'm making. Do we need confirmation of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ? It is not, and I choose my words carefully, it is not that he is divine. It is that he is deity. He is God, part of the triune Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Here's confirmation in this statement of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. As in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah beheld, had a vision of God in his glory. So here, and the parallel between the two statements, I hope, confirms it. We have a testimony to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But then I want us to think about the extent of his exaltation. He has been made exceedingly high. I was saying to Richard over lunch, or perhaps he was saying to me, but we were agreeing. We sometimes struggle, don't we? Struggle with words. I'm not talking about our inability to convey what we want to c convey, although that's often the case. Sometimes that's down to us and our grasp of language. But even if we have a good grasp of language, there are times when we struggle to convey what we want to, because the language itself isn't really good enough. And we have an example of it here. And we'll have another example of it a little later in my comments. What do I mean? Well, how can we, how can we convey the level of exaltation? How high? It's something that's above human measurement. It's something that's beyond human description. But I will mention Mr. Darby's translation of this particular phrase because what it does is it reveals to us, and you might get it here from your King James Version or what version you're using, and that is three steps upwards in the exaltation of the Saviour. He shall be exalted, step one, and be lifted up, step two, and be very high, step three. That's wonderful. It's a reference to the Lord's resurrection, the Lord's ascension, and the Lord's exaltation post-Calvary. What is being emphasised is that the position that he takes up is absolute, is unsurpassed. This is where my daughter-in-law would get on to me for using big words. But we use bigger words because we struggle to describe, even in the best of English words, what the writer wants to convey to us of the supreme and unsurpassed exaltation of Christ. The position and the glory associated with his exaltation is beyond comparison, is beyond compare, and we'd even say beyond description. And one final point here, it cannot cannot ever be taken away from him. Isn't that wonderful? In verse 13, if it gives us a simple summary of the life of the Lord, let's come now to his work as we move into verse 14. Isaiah writes, As many were astonished at thee, The construction of these two verses is not, because we believe in divine inspiration, is not an accident. And it's the contrast between where he is now, but where he came to. And says the writer, they were astonished. That's our King James Version translation. And you might think, well, that's a misspelling of astonished. Uh, not quite. Many were astonished. You might use the word astonished, yes. But it's more than that. It's deeper than that. It means that they were appalled. That's not too strong a word. They were stunned. They were horrified. It expresses deep bewilderment and amazement. And I'm using multiple words to describe something which we're struggling, struggling to find appropriate words. And one Hebrew scholar I would quote, put it this way. He says, the word means to be desolate or waste, to be thrown into a desolate and bereaved condition, to be startled and confused beyond compare, petrified, by paralysing astonishment. Even under divine inspiration we get the idea that the writer is struggling to convey what he wants to convey 
of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. They looked upon him. We'll come to that in a moment. But I want you to notice too, it says, as many were astonished at thee. You see again the extent of the revulsion. They looked upon him and what they felt was horror. An impression not gained by the few, but an abiding image that remained in the memory of many. Why? Well, says the writer, the next phrase, his visage was so marred. What was it that they found horrifying? His face. Now, I look out upon my audience and I, I try, when I'm speaking, to try and catch the gaze, just to see who's awake, but to catch the gaze of my audience. I look into your face. What I can't tell is what's going on behind that face, but I hope it's positive. But when they looked upon the Saviour, and when they saw his marred, disfigured, and distorted face, They didn't know how to describe it. It paralyzed them, paralyzed them with astonishment at the change that had been wrought in that blessed face. And notice, as I've said, as I look out upon you, the face, the first thing I look at, what is it? It's the face. And that's the first thing that people saw when they looked upon the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. What paralysed them with fear, what paralysed them with astonishment was his face. But then the writer goes further than that and he says, and his form, his form more than the sons of men. Extending down from his face, extending down from his face, it expanded upon the whole scope of his body. Marred. In the annals of human suffering, says the writer in essence, the experience of the Saviour stands out. <clears throat> it exceeds that of others. It exceeds that of others because he suffered, and what he suffered encompassed not just the physical, but also the spiritual transaction that he wrought, that transaction that was necessary to put away your sin and mine. And that brings us to the next phrase. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Now I know there might be one or two theologians in the company, so I'll have to be careful in my interpretation here. <coughs> with so shall he sprinkle many, many nations. What does this phrase mean? Well, we could link it with what precedes it. And we could think about those sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. We could think about that face that was marred more than any man's, that form more than the sons of men. And we could take it as a reference to the extent of the Lord's work at Calvary. And we could say it provides a description of the provision that he made for many nations. And drawing a parallel perhaps with the high priest's act of sprinkling the blood of the sacrifice on items that needed purification, whether it be in the tabernacle or the temple, we could say, ah, there's the answer. He sprinkled many nations. Well, if you think that, sorry, I don't. <laughs> I've built you up and now I knock you down. <coughs> sorry. I'm not saying that that's not quite, I'm not saying that that's not a justified approach to this verse. And I think there's a lovely thought in it. I don't want to appear as if I'm being condemnatory. It's a difficult passage to know whether to take it and link it with what precedes 
or as I'm about to do, to link it with what follows. So shall he sprinkle. Well, if we take that word sprinkle, and I know that that's a common translation across Bible versions, the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's called the Septuagint, uses the word not sprinkle, but the word marvel, or as we might alternatively translate it, startle. Okay? Startle. It indicates a reaction. What verse 14 has described is what they saw. What verse 15 describes is their reaction to what they saw. I hope that makes sense. Verse 14 describes what they saw. Verse 15 describes the reaction, their reaction to what they saw. It indicates that they tremble with astonishment. But they'll tremble with astonishment because, as verse 15 goes on to say, because of a momentous, surprising change that has taken place in the servant of Jehovah. The last time men saw him, and the last time men saw him, that's the reality for the world. The last time they saw him was upon Calvary's cross. Brutalized, disfigured, and ultimately dead. But the transformation now in verse 15 is remarkable. Come to the next phrase. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. That is, kings will be speechless, rendered silent. This will be involuntary because of the overpowering impression that they will be given. There was no silence at Calvary. There was no silence at Calvary. We remember the frenzied cry of the mob, crucify him, crucify him. But here's the transformation. Because the Lord will not be seen lifted up upon a cross, crucified. But he'll be seen in exaltation. He'll be seen in glory lifted up upon a throne <coughs> and then in a different way every mouth will be stopped and all the world will stand guilty before God kings shall shut their mouths at him when the Lord Jesus Christ comes not to the air to take his own believing people home to heaven as described in 1 Thessalonians 4 but when he comes back to the earth, and when he comes back to the earth to reign upon the earth, then indeed kings will see him, and their mouths will be shut. They will think back to what the scripture records, and some of which is given us in verse 14, of what they last saw of this man, and they'll see him transformed they'll see him in glory and says this last phrase of the verse that which had not been told them shall they see and that which they had not heard shall they consider it explains the silence doesn't it explains the silence of these kings time won't allow us really to say more and just realize what the time is it's gone but that will be the change. That will be the transformation. And so in this brief gallop through Isaiah 52, 13 to 15, we've thought of the servant's wisdom and the servant's prudence. We've thought of his exaltation, his honour and glory. We've contrasted that to the fact that voluntarily he humbled himself, became obedient obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we thought of his intense suffering leading up to the cross 
and on the cross. But then we've thought of him not only in exaltation, in honour and in glory, but when he will return to this world that cast him out, he will return to this world that crucified him and the vision that some will have in a coming day of his manifestation and of his glory. Then, it says, they, that which they had not heard, shall they consider. We've thought a little of the remarkable prophetic scriptures here in Isaiah's prophecy that may our appreciation of the Saviour have been deepened and our affection drawn out to him. He is our Saviour. Important, isn't it, in the light of what we've thought of today, not only to know him as our Saviour, to make him as Lord of our life. And whatever he asks, that we might be like the perfect servant, willing to do. Shall we pray? Now, Father, again, we bless thee for our consideration of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as this morning, so this afternoon, we thank thee for every opportunity to meditate upon him and for all that thou hast left on record in thy word. That record that speaks of him. And we have to say with the Apostle John that if all had been recorded, then the world would not be sufficient to contain the books that could have been written, that might have been written concerning him. But that which thou hast given us and that which thou hast left on record, we bless thee for every page and for every glimpse that it gives us of him. One day, our Father, we thank thee, we shall see him. One day we shall be like him. And our Father, we bless thee one day we shall praise him as we ought. And for this little while between, we look to thee, our Father, to give enabling help, help that we need in our day-to-day -day lives to serve thee, and to serve thee in a way that is befitting of the one who died in such agony and shame and suffering upon Calvary, and did so for us. We commend our, our time together to thee. We thank thee for the fellowship of thy people here and pray that something of our consideration today might not only have been to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, but to the blessing, to the encouragement and help of thy people. We give thanks again in the Saviour's name. Amen. Thank John once again for coming on and uh, helping us in the teaching uh, of the scriptures and for pointing us uh, to the person of Christ. We just finished our time together with a song of worship. Uh, there's two or three uh, in mind that I uh, was thinking about, but I think we're finished with number two. Number two, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. We sing from verse 3, we sing verses 3, 4 and 5, uh, standing at Bravel of number 2. <coughs> Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side.
thanks once again for coming and joining us for uh, the first of the, well hopefully the first of our annual conference going uh, going forward. I was looking back at uh, the last conference notice I sent out before, before this one uh, and uh, it was in 2019 before Covid hit and guess what the date was? It was the 26th of October and guess who the speaker was? John Bennett. So there's a kind of symmetry from uh, kind of symmetry from when we finished uh, to when we started again. So thank you for coming and joining us. It's been good uh, to have your fellowship together. Just a reminder uh, that the clocks do go back tonight, uh, so you do get an extra hour uh, in bed uh, tonight. Uh, so this is how I spent my anniversary. Yeah. That's right. So anyway, God bless and uh, safe journeys home.